have to have anybody tell us that the, that the year or the day is the year of jubilee or prosperity because we will know that. We will look at Jesus in his face, amen, and we will shout his praises and sing and live forever and ever for our eternity in the prosperity of God, amen. How many of you are longing to see that day with me? Amen, amen. Let us turn again to our scripture of reading, Ephesians chapter 4 in your Bibles. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. And if you would, read along with me. I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. When you have it, say, Pastor, I got it. Praise God. Let's begin together. But unto every one of us is given what? Grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led and he gave. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Verse 10, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some, and some, and some, and for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, let's all say this together, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Our topic is simple. We're talking about spiritual gifts today. Spiritual gifts. Let us pray together. Lord God in heaven, I thank you uh, for this opportunity for the host church, Normandy Avenue, and for Pastor Jenkins and the membership of this awesome uh, church. And we are praying today that your spirit would renew us fall afresh on us today we need your anointing god no other thing can do it a, a good shower a fresh set of clothes won't do it we need a fresh anointing in this place so we ask that you'd come upon us like a mighty rushing wind and that you would blow away all of our doubts and in and in and in place of our doubts grant us faith faith that jesus had and we ask for power power to live right power to witness and power to overcome all things that is in our lives. And we ask today that you would open up our eyes and we would behold wonderful things out of your law. We pray this thing in the name of Jesus. Let all God's people say, amen. April 1990, the name Peter Drucker will be familiar to you if you are a student of business or economics. To put it simply, he is one of the great minds of the 20th century. His writings include Managing for Results, The New Society, The Effective Exe Executive, and America's Next 20 Years. For over a generation, he has taught in the leading universities of America. These are his words. Progress is obtained only by exploiting opportunities not by solving problems. When you solve problems, all you do is guarantee a return to normalcy. It is a statement worth pondering. Most of us spend most of our time solving problems. And in so doing, we think uh, we are making progress. In actuality, merely solving a problem only returns us to status quo. The same is true of every human endeavor. We spend most of our time solving problems and wondering why we don't make any progress. It is no less true when we come into the church, we come into the family of God, we come into the body of Christ. The biggest part of our energy is spent solving problems, putting out fires, Pastor Jenkins, and sticking out our finger in the in the ram to hold, the dam rather, to hold back the on-rushing water. Uh, problem solving is important. Would you agree to that? Even crucial, but it is not progress. Progress only comes when you exploit opportunities. In other words, when you take a chance. When you go out on a limb, when you risk something, that is when you are making progress. And today we will learn about spiritual opportunities to advance the progress of God's kingdom. 
Here's some questions that we want to ask today as we go into our word. Uh, what is a spiritual gift? And I, 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 I trust that all of you have your Bibles today uh, because we are going to peruse the scriptures and finding out exactly what God says about spiritual gifts. What is a spiritual gift? Unfortunately, there are a great deal of uh, ideas out in the world, a great deal of confusion on this topic. Some people think that a spiritual gift is the same thing as a natural talent. Uh, some people believe it is like playing the piano or, or throwing a football or even tinkering with a car. Others think that a spiritual gift refers only to those who speak in tongues. Because there is so much confusion, a precise definition is needed. Here is the definition that I would like to submit to you this evening. Uh, a spiritual gift is a God-given ability which enables a believer to effectively serve the body of Christ. I'll say that again. A spiritual gift, repeat after me as a matter of fact, a spiritual gift is a God-given ability which enables a believer to effectively serve the body of Christ. Amen. Every part of that definition is important. Spiritual gifts are given, which is why Ephesians 4, our scripture of passage today, our passage of reading, says to us, receive your spiritual gift. You don't earn or apply for a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift is an ability, which means it qualifies you to do something you wouldn't otherwise be willing or able to do. Spiritual gifts are only for believers. I should have had an amen right about there. Spiritual gifts are only for believers. They, are, which is why they say they are different from natural talents. Everyone has a natural talent. Everyone has something you are good at, amen? If I go around the room right now, everybody will be able to at least tell me of one talent that you naturally possess. Uh, and they are given to, to, given to us to enable us as, as believers to effectively serve the body of Christ. Of course, there are many people who serve but not very effectively. Would you agree to that? Those who discover and use their spiritual gifts serve effectively in the body of Christ. So by way of further clarification, let's go over uh, again some of the points. A spiritual gift is not a natural talent. A person may have a natural talent in some area and not be spiritually gifted at all. Some talents and gifts go together and sometimes they don't. Number two, a spiritual gift is not the fruit of the spirit. We need to clear that up. The fruit of the spirit, the Bible says, is love, joy, peace, goodness, meekness, faith, and temperance. Above all else, there, there is no law. Uh, so that is the fruit of the Spirit. But a spiritual gift now is an ability that we have given from God to enable us to serve the body of Christ. Amen? So the fruit of the Spirit refers to the nine character qualities that we can find mentioned in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control or temperance. All believers are to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. And, but not all people have the same gift of the Spirit. Are you clear on that tonight? The third thing I want to make sure that we are all clear on is a spiritual gift is not a ministry role. That is, there is no such thing as the gift of youth work or the gift of writing Christian music, or the gift of urban ministry, or the gift of evangelizing Buddhists. Those are simply cases where believers use their gifts, like teaching and evangelism and service, and helps in a particular way. But, the, but those same gifts could be used in other ways as well. Does every believer have a spiritual gift? There are many sincere individuals who doubt that they have any spiritual gift at all. They see no place where they can serve effectively in the body of Christ. But the Bible leaves no doubt on this question. Let's look at three particular verses. If you have your Bibles with me, turn uh, your Bibles uh, to the book of Romans, chapter 12. 
and verse 6. What book did I say, everyone? Romans 12 and verse 6. When you have it, say amen. amen. Let's read together. Verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, where the prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Amen? So the Bible has just told us that everyone has has a proportion, have different gifts according to the grace that God has given to us. And Paul uses, and you will see this as we go through the texts, he uses different words to describe spiritual gifts. In one passage, he may call it the manifestation of the Spirit. Another passage, he calls it the grace that's been given to us. And other, in another passage, he may call it a, 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 a spiritual gift, a grace, and a manifestation. Let's go to the, our second text. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. What book did I say, everyone? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. First Corinthians 12 and 7. If you have it, say, Pastor, I got it. All right, together, let's read. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to how many people? Just a couple of folk, every man to profit with all. Or in essence, God has given everybody who's a part of the body of Christ spiritual gifts. Everyone has at least one gift. Everybody has at least one gift. So we see in Romans, Paul uses the word grace to describe the gift. And in 1 Corinthians, he uses uh, the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all, or to, 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 to uh, profit the body of Christ. Let's go back. Let's go back now. The third, the third uh, passage I want to share with you today is a passage that we already read in, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 7. Let's go to that, Ephesians 4 and verse 7. Have it say amen. The, Bi the Bible says in verse 7, but unto every one of us is given what? Grace. That magical word, that beautiful word. Every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So when Paul here uses the word grace, he's talking about what, everybody? The spiritual gifts. Does everyone see that? So in those three particular verses that we just read, Paul is using different words, but he's talking about the same thing. He's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. He says, to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Notice the repeated expressions again. We have different gifts to each one, uh, to each one of us. In Romans, he uses the word gifts. In Corinthians, he says manifestation of the Spirit. In Ephesians, he simply calls it grace. But Paul is talking about the same thing each and every time. Spiritual gifts are, are grace gifts which manifest the Spirit's working in a believer's life. And they are given to each and every one of us. Therefore, we can say without the slightest doubt that spiritual gifts are given to every believer. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, I've got a spiritual gift. Look at your other neighbor and say, I've got a spiritual gift. If you are a Christian, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a spiritual gift. As a matter of fact, you probably have more than one. Paul is believed to have several gifts, apostleship, prophecy, teaching, tongues, evangelism, and leadership, just to name a few that are evident in the Bible. In Acts 6, Philip uh, is, has the gift of service, and later in Acts 8, he exercises the gift of evangelism. On that basis, I believe it's likely that most of us will have one or two dominant gifts 
and several other lesser gifts. We are therefore on safe ground to talk about gift mix or a mix of the gifts where one believer might have the gift of giving, teaching, and faith while another may have the gift of evangelism and leadership. So when are the gifts given? When are the gifts given? The Bible does not directly address this question, but uh, an analogy is helpful. We receive natural talents by virtue of our natural birth in our earthly families. It makes perfect sense to believe that we receive our spiritual gifts as part of our spiritual birth into the family of God. So depending on your family and your heritage, there are certain natural inclinations and natural abilities that we all have, amen? And in a spiritual sense, depending upon the church you are in, follow me now, depending upon the ministry that you are involved in or the pastor of your church, you are going to be given a particular gift for that particular church. Is that clear? So it's not just a generalizing gift. God gives us specific gifts to fit specific places. The same way we've been given natural abilities, like if you are a son or a daughter of an athlete, chances are you will have what? Athletic abilities. If you are the son or daughter of an intellectual, chances are you will have intellectual abilities. So on and so forth. In the same way, where we are born spiritually, where we are fed and nourished spiritually, God is going to give us a spiritual gift for that particular church. Amen. Let's go on. Spiritual gifts are given at the moment of our salvation. So the moment you believe, God has already enabled you to do something. The moment you come to faith, the moment you come to the point where you accept Christ as your personal savior, and I want to assume that everyone here has, and, I, and so I can, I can further say that everyone who is here today, under the power of the Holy Spirit, you already have your spiritual gifts. Some may ask, is it possible to have a gift for years and not know it? The answer is yes. It's very possible to neglect your spiritual gifts. Let's turn again in the Bible. 1 Timothy 4 and 14. What book did I say? 1 Timothy 4, 4 and 13. I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 4, 4 and 14. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Let's read this together. I don't want no one to miss this text. The Bible says, neglect not the gift that is where? In thee, which has, which was rather given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. That's an old English word that means elder or overseer. So the Bible has just told us here that it is possible to neglect your spiritual gift. It is possible to be sitting on your ability to improve your church. It is possible to be sitting on the power that God has given you and you have not activated or stirred up that gift in order to improve, in order to enhance, in order to effectively use and, and, and encourage those who are in your particular church. The Bible says, neglect not the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. And the, 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 the spiritual gifts are like seeds. Some come up earlier and some come up later. But seeds were always there in our lives. So why are these gifts given? There is no doubt the most important question for us to answer. Our definition su uh, su suggests that the basic purpose of spiritual gifts is to enable us to effectively serve the body of Christ. That essentially is what Romans 12 says. Just as each of us has a body with many members, uh, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are uh, many in form, many form one body, each member uh, belongs to all the others. I like that. The Bible has just told us each member belongs to everybody. So your gift does not belong to you. 
Some people believe that my, it's my spiritual gift. It's my gift of evangelism or my gift of mercy or my gift of leadership. No, it is not. It is the church's gift. It belongs to the body of Christ. And at times, people ask you to do things that fall in your goodness, and out of reluctance and inconvenience, we say no. Neglecting the gift that God has given us. Neglecting, sitting on those gifts. So I want to encourage you to sit on your gift, the gift that God has given to you. And many of us have an inclination as to where those gifts lie. If you have never taken a spiritual gifts inventory or have never been to a spiritual gift seminar, most of the time your natural spirit or your spiritual gifts is in line with your natural abilities and your personality. And your personality. So the things that you like to do, those are the areas in which God has gifted you in to improve and to effectively serve the body of Christ. We all have different gifts according to the grace that is given to us. The church is like a body, and we are all the body parts. There are eyes and there are toes. There are hips and there are elbows. There are ears and there are lungs and belly buttons and all the rest. Each part of the body fulfills a particular role. Your spiritual gift is given to enable you to fulfill your God-given role in the body of Christ. That's why there are so many spiritual gifts. And, and, and Paul goes uh, in, in, in various lengths to describe them. Some are teachers and some are givers. Some are helpers and some are prayers. Some are evangelizers and some are organizers and so on. The different gifts are like the different body parts. I heard it put this way. When God got ready to organize his church, he didn't set up a dictatorship to organize his church. He didn't set up a, 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 set up a dictatorship with a pastor. Head. He also didn't set up a democracy where everybody had an equal say in everything. When God got ready to organize his church, he set up a body with Christ as the head and each Christian as a part of that body. Spiritual gifts enable the body parts, that's you and me, to function in it correctly. That's why the question, uh, uh, why, what is my spiritual gift? This is important, or what is my spiritual gift? Unless you know the answer, you will never be effective 100% in your service for Christ. You may spend your life doing something for which you were not gifted by and so be frustrated and ineffective. Sometimes we believe that if we change churches, we'd be happier. Sometimes we believe if I can, if I can just find another pastor more effective. Maybe it's just you've been neglecting your spiritual gift. Maybe you've been neglecting the God-given ability that he has impressed you with, that he has implanted in your heart and your life so that you can be happy. The reason why some of us are not happy or not effective or don't find, oh, well, I'm not getting fed here. Or, uh, the people don't like me here. Function in your gift. Bear fruit wherever you are. God has planted you somewhere, bear fruit. God has given you something, use it. Don't care, don't, don't mind what other people are saying or don't mind what, 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 what you've been through or what past you may have had. God has cleaned all that up, amen? And he's given you power to be effective wherever you are. And we will not come to the maturity that we need to be in Christ unless we are active in our spiritual gifts. It's sort of like taking one of those big offensive linemen and putting him out at the wide receiver position. He can't run, he can't catch balls, uh, and his hands are like bricks, but put him left guard and he's right at home. Why? Because he was born to knock people on their backside. And that's what you've been specialized to do. In the same way, some people throw, uh, throw up when they are forced to go door to door witnessing. They aren't gifted in evangelism. And we should not force people to do things they're not gifted in. But those same people over, put those same people over finances, and because they have the gift of, of administration, they are incredibly successful. There are others who could never uh, get up and teach a class, but they know how to lead a small group. 
because they have the gift of pastoring. Still others work behind the scenes and carry for the sick, bringing over meals, comforting those who are in sorrow. They have the gift of mercy. But don't ask them to speak in public. The very thought of them makes them break out into hives. It is the obligation of church leadership and those who are spiritually mature in the local church to encourage to, dis to encourage people to discover their spiritual gifts. And once they discover them, to find a place to use those gifts in the body of Christ. That is what, that is a solemn obligation of your local elders and your local ministry leaders and your pastor. They are in charge of, those, uh, of leading everybody in the church to discover what their spiritual gift is. And that way, Pastor Jenkins, you can, you, can, you can feel me on this one. When everyone fires their spiritual gifts, you know, the pastor doesn't need to push you any longer. Doesn't need to prod you. Why? You're in your lane. If gift of administration is your thing, you, no one needs to tell you to lead. No one needs to tell you to keep the books or to take notes. No one needs to do that. Why? Because you are in your lane. You are doing something that God has given you the ability to do. So that is why, in order for us to have maximum effectiveness for Jesus Christ, we need to have our, or the knowledge of our spiritual gifts. So how many spiritual gifts are there? This has been a question, and some people say that all the spiritual gifts are mentioned in the Bible. I would go further and to say, no matter what people say, there will be some who disagree with, uh, with what the Bible says. Part of the problem is that the New Testament does not contain a unified list of all the gifts. It actually contains six lists in four passages. And if you're taking notes tonight, I want to encourage you to write down where these passages are found. The, uh, the, the, one of the first passages where you'll find the spiritual gifts listed is Romans chapter 12. Romans what, everyone? Romans 12. Uh, there are three places in 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14 talk about spiritual gifts. And one in Ephesians chapter 4 and another place in 1 Peter 4. So once again, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, Ephesians chapter 4, and 1 Peter 4. Furthermore, these lists don't completely overlap. Some gifts are mentioned in one list, and others, and not in others. And some gifts are mentioned several times, and sometimes only once. So it's a bit confusing. So if you study the various writers on spiritual gifts, you will find a quite uh, a lot of disagreement on the subject of how many gifts are listed in the New Testament. Uh, for the sake of convenience, I want to just give you a few of those in four categories. There's one category. It's called the category of the service gifts, and they are mercy, Giving, helps, and service. These are the people that work behind the scenes. These are the people with a introverted personality. These are the people who don't mind coming over to help you do something or to pick you up or to cook something for you. These are the kind of people that will go out of their way just to be nice. Those are the folk that you want to be uh, uh, in your church. A lot of people in the church have the gifts of service. Another category of gifts is the gift of leadership, the gifts of leadership. Leadership is a, a particular gift, faith, discernment, wisdom, knowledge, and evangelism. These are the gifts that many of us in our congregations, we uh, celebrate them because they are readily seen. If someone has the gift of evangelism, they are preaching, or the gift of, of discernment, they are the ones helping others and giving good advice when someone needs to know which way to turn in life. And the gift of wisdom is when someone can discern between uh, good and evil, be able to see uh, which way God wants to take, to take someone or the church. The next category of spiritual gifts is teaching gifts, and that is teaching, of course, pastoring and exhortation. And the last, the last category is foundation. This is where uh, the gifts are listed. Uh, apostleship, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, miracles, and healings. It's called foundational because this are, these are the gifts which began the Christian movement. Remember in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Ghost fell on the disciples in the upper room? They were all given the gift of tongues. 
And they went out and they proclaimed the mighty power of God to all the many nations that were there. And 3,000 men came to salvation. But there's one more question which I want to leave to you. May, it may have not occurred to you tonight. Are the various lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament meant to be exhaustive or suggestive? That is, do the various lists, when taken together, give us all the possible gifts or could ever be in existence? A surprising number of people believe that Paul never intended every list to be uh, a possible gift of the Spirit, and therefore the lists are meant to be examples of the ways the Holy Spirit gifts the believers. So in other words, what we read in the Bible cannot contain what God can do. So there are gifts that we have and some people have that the Bible does not talk about. The book of John tells us that after, uh, after John had written his, 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 his gospel, he says if everything were written in uh, books about what Jesus had done, all the world will be filled with books. The world itself cannot contain the books that will be written about Jesus. So in essence, there are things that we have experienced and there are, are people who have spiritual gifts that the Bible doesn't talk about. In our day and age, I believe the gift of technology is a spiritual gift. I believe the gift of music is a spiritual gift, even though the Bible does not necessarily quote those things or say those things. There are various gifts. So depending upon your church, once again, depending upon your ministry, depending upon your personality and the place where you are, God is going to give you a particular gift to function effectively where he has you. Amen? Let's go on. The New Testament is infinitely creative with, with, with God's word. And therefore, we have to look at these lists as representatives of the kinds of God-given abilities we can find in the body of Christ. So, why should you attempt to discover your spiritual gift? By discovering your spiritual gift, you clarify God's will for your life. A lot of us are trying to find purpose. Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? If you discover your, your spiritual gift, you will clarify for yourself God's will for your life. It will be as if you have found something you've never known you were looking for. It will be as if God has opened up your eyes to a whole new world of existing. When you discover your spiritual gifts, God's will is clear. You no longer have to ask, what's my purpose any longer? As you discover your gifts and begin to use them, you are fulfilling God's will for your life. If, you, if your gift is giving, then as you seek opportunities to meet spiritual, uh, material and financial needs, not only do you help others, and not only are you personally satisfied, but you are also doing God's will. It is, if your gift is evangelism, and you go door to door for evangelism, uh, 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 an event, you are doing the will of God for your life. Are you with me tonight? Whatever your gift is, when you are functioning in that gift, you are fulfilling God's will. You are doing what God has given you to do. There are signposts that point the way toward the will of God. God will never call you to a position or, or ministry without first giving you the gifts you need to be successful in that position. Therefore, knowing your spiritual gifts will help you make wise decisions in life. By discovering your spiritual gift, you benefit the entire church. By discovering your spiritual gifts, you are enhancing the ministry where you've been planted. The church is a body, Christ is the head, and we are the joints, the ligaments, the bones, the muscles. Each of us exercises our own spiritual gifts, and the church grows. This is God's plan for church growth. It's not better programs. It's not better songs. It's not, it's not more money dumped into this ministry or that ministry. It's every person functioning in their giftedness. And that way, we can experience church growth. By the way, there's one interesting sidelight in, in the verse that we read. Paul said that as this happens, the church is built up in love, which means that the doctrine of spiritual gifts, when properly understood and properly taught, tends to promote love and unity in God's church. 
So there's a lot of people that sit around and, and bicker about, oh, how the church is not unified. Well, are you functioning in your spiritual gift? Oh, they should be doing this and should be doing that. Well, instead of pointing what other people should be doing, are you doing what you should be doing? So when, 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 when we function in this, we improve the church, we grow the church, we promote love and unity. When properly understood, it promotes love and unity in the body of Christ. No more competition. No more complaining. No more paralyzed body parts. As we all use our spiritual gifts, we grow in number, we grow in grace, we grow in love for one another. By discovering your spiritual gifts, it enables you, lastly, to glorify God. For all things, God has given us a lot of gifts, and when we function in those gifts, we glorify God. You give God the glory. You may not be able to sing, but you are giving God glory when you function in your spiritual gift. You may not feel comfortable raising your hand and shouting hallelujah, but as long as you are functioning in your spiritual gift, you are giving God glory. As long as you are functioning in your spiritual gift, God receives praise and honor. Why? You are doing what he created you to do. You are doing what he made you to do. So it is imperative. It is important. It is a matter of survival of your local church and church growth and unity and love that we function in our spiritual gifts. So what steps should we take today? I want to I want to suggest that you first of all, if you would, my brother, appreciate that. You first of all begin to pray and to ask God where your giftedness lies. You may want to go a step further. You may want to take a spiritual gifts inventory. There are several out there. There's so many, and any one of them is good, just to give you a good direction. None of them are exhaustive, but it will help you discover where your natural gifts and your spiritual gifts lie, and your personality lies. And when you begin to see the picture of God's will for your life, it will give you a sense of purpose. It will give you a sense of usefulness. You will be part, as we began our message today, not simply solving problems, but exploiting opportunities. Many of us are afraid of what God has in store for us because it, it, it means that we've got to be responsible now. It means that we've got to take it upon ourselves to be good students and to be good stewards of our gifts. Each and every one of us are responsible for the body of Christ where we are. Each, every, each, each and every one of us are responsible to give God glory. We're responsible to find God's will for our lives. And you know what? When you find God's will, you got to help somebody else find God's will for them. So when you find your spiritual gifts, don't just keep it to yourself. Help somebody else discover what their gifts may be. Do you want to discover your spiritual gift? If you do, just raise your hand. Maybe you've already understood what your spiritual gift is. Just raise your hand anyway, just to affirm tonight that, Lord, I want to function in my spiritual gift. I want to give you glory. I want to know and be clear and clarified on your will for my life. I want to be a problem solver and exploit opportunity to improve progress in my church. Amen? Amen. Won't you bow your heads with me as we pray today? Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your giftedness in our lives. We thank you for ascending on high so that you could give gifts to men. And on that awesome day, in, on the day of Pentecost, when you fell upon those 120 disciples, you gave them the gift of tongues. And ever since that time, you've been falling on people all over the world, irrespective of their gender, irrespective of their ethnicity, irrespective of their class and society, irrespective of their intelligence, irrespective of their height or their build, you have given them gifts as they have come to love and to accept Christ as their Savior. So tonight, dear Lord, we stand in agreement. We lift our hands in agreement. We prostrate our hearts in agreement today, wanting to know more about spiritual gifts. 
wanting to be solid on where our spiritual gifts lie so that we can be a part of your body, effective and maturing everyone into the fullness of Jesus Christ so that when you shall come again in the clouds of glory, Lord, you will find us faithfully working. You will find us faithfully executing the tasks that you have gotten for us. You will find us faithful, God. So when you come again, we want to hear those beautiful words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in those few gifts. Now be in charge over many. Enter into the joy of my Father. We can't wait for that day, dear Lord, when we shall see you face to face and we will continue to function in our spiritual gifts. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say, Amen. If you believe the word of the Lord tonight, I want you to put your hands together and give God some praise. Hallelujah.